Hey guys, I'm in New York filming some more Masterpiece series demonstrations with three different artists. You'll hear more about that next year. So I asked Pavel Sokov to help me out with an oil painting demo. He's really awesome. You can check out his work at Pavel Sokov on Instagram. And make sure to check out his new podcast, creativemastermindshow.com, where I will be a guest soon. Happy Halloween, everybody. Take it away, Pavel. Hey guys, my name is Pavel Sokov. I'm an oil portrait painter and fine artist. Today, I'm at my buddy Alex's studio where I'm gonna paint a spooky skull for you guys in one session. Before I started painting, I like to come up with a couple of thumbnails to nail down the composition. I do these from imagination usually. So in these ones, I played with the placement of the skull, the direction of the lighting, and the orientation of the canvas. After coming up with these four thumbnail sketches, I got kind of a better idea of what I actually want from my painting. Also, it sort of helps to have a thumbnail completed to use as reference when I start my painting because if I don't have anything to look at, it's possible that when I start from scratch on my canvas, my subject will end up too big or even worse, run off the page or something. Composition is a bit of a feeling thing along with some guidelines. It's not like stiff rules that you must follow. So having said that, I think I like sketch one and three the most. You know, since the color temperature plays such a big role, I digitally painted the sketch with some invented color before actually even making the setup just to get an idea of what kind of mood this painting would be. And it also gave me an opportunity to plan some of the painting methods and steps that I will use in the actual painting process. Okay, so with these sketches in mind, let's put together the setup that I'll be painting from today. So a big challenge to overcome here with this uh, skull is that I want to paint it in the dark for a more dramatic and moody atmosphere since it's Halloween and all. But at the same time, I want myself and my easel to be in the light so I can see and we can make this video. Sadly, the candle doesn't provide a strong enough light during the day. So we're gonna use a warm lamp instead. Since we don't want to burn the house down though by lighting that black box on fire, I think our candle shouldn't be lit at the beginning stages of the painting. I'm using a portable paint box today that makes it convenient for me to paint anywhere I go. For my brushes, I plan to use a lot of bristles because I want to load this painting up with a lot of thick paint. But I also packed a few softer brushes to get some soft edges in there too. As my painting surface today, I'm using an 11 by 14 linen panel. It's actually one of my favorite sizes for life paintings. I paint with a few different brands of oil paint, but there's no need to name them or be concerned with what they are. What's really important about that is that they're professional grade and they're not the student grade, which are very difficult to paint with. It just doesn't work, it's like toothpaste, so don't even get it. Okay, let's squeeze out our paint. And don't be afraid to use a lot. For the longest time, I've been so shy with squeezing out my paint. It's been taking me years to paint thicker and thicker. And I gotta tell you, if you could skip all these years of being shy and just get straight into it and load up a lot of paint, it will save you a lot of trouble. On my palette today, we have titanium white, warm white, cadmium yellow light, cadmium yellow medium, cadmium yellow orange, yellow ochre, transparent yellow oxide. Yeah, we got a lot of yellows here. It's gonna be a very warm scene. I'll just put the rest of the colors up on the screen. You can pause it if you really wanna know. The very first thing I always like to do when starting a painting is to tint the canvas but you have to select your tinting color wisely because it's going to provide the underlying temperature to the whole piece. I often let this initial tint show through all the way to the end of the painting, particularly in the shadows. In this case, we have a very warm light on our subject, so we can expect our painting to be pretty warm. I'm going to tint this canvas with that in mind by using something really warm like transparent red oxide and I'll mix it with a bit of cadmium yellow medium in the area where the candle will go because later all this warm underpainting should give the skull a nice inner glow. I'm diluting my paint with Gamsol here when I do my initial washes. 
because it makes the paint behave kind of like a watercolor, which is perfect for making a stain. Okay, so now that our canvas is tinted, we can start to draw or lay in on top of our stain. My favorite tool to do that with is actually a hard bristle brush. The reason why is that those stiff hairs, they allow me to get nice straight lines, which are the exact type of lines that I find helpful at this stage to simplify the contours of everything that I'm drawing and to find those big shapes. Don't worry, we're gonna complicate these lines later when we go to paint them. As you draw your lay-in, don't forget to focus on the big shapes and the proportions of what you're drawing. Don't get carried away with details and things like that because it's way too early at this stage. Simplify everything to its most basic elements. Find the big shapes and don't mind the secondary forms for now. It also kind of helps to keep your horizon line in mind when you draw your land. For example, in my case, I'm sitting below the skull so I'm looking up at it. You have to ask yourself, are you looking up at your setup? Are you looking down at it? And whatever the answer is, you have to design your lines with that in mind. So if you're noticing that your drawing is off at this stage, don't be shy to move lines around until you get it right. Trust me, you're gonna be saving yourself a lot of headaches if you fix things at this early stage than if you try to fix them later on when you have a lot of opaque paint down on your painting. So right now I'm filling in the dark shapes on my underpainting because I find that it helps me see my mistakes better when I fill in the big dark shapes. With these dark shapes filled in, it's much easier to judge the distances on your drawing. At this point, I often like to take a kneadable eraser or more often a napkin and rub out the lightest areas. This helps me establish the light source a lot sooner before I even lay down the opaque paint. Just make sure to do this before your stain is dry or else you won't be able to do it anymore. You usually have about 10 minutes max, depending on your surface before your wash dries, so be careful. My goal here is to establish the big values, shapes, and color temperatures as soon as I can. So to do that, I'm gonna cover the entire skull with some opaque paint aiming primarily to kind of tell the story of the lighting that's hitting our skull. I'm thinking a lot about color temperature. Our primary light is warm, so I'm mindful that the parts that are in the light are going to stay warm. Oftentimes students want to lighten an area, so they grab a bunch of white. White is actually the coldest color, so the result of that is that the value of the area does go up and it does become lighter, but at the same time, the color temperature goes a lot colder. This is actually great if your subject is in a cold light, like maybe a north lighting window. But in our case, our subject is in a warm light, so that's no good for us. When you wanna lighten an area that's in the light, consider using a color to lighten that area. In this case, to lighten my mixtures, I'm going to include some cadmium yellow medium, cadmium yellow, and transparent yellow oxide in my light mixtures to keep it warm. But conversely, if you wanna darken an area, a lot of students reach for the black to darken things, and that creates a cold mixture as well. Try darkening a shadow with a warm dark. Something like transparent red oxide, uh, transparent brown oxide, or alizarin crimson. While you're putting down that initial opaque paint, a good principle to work by is to paint the lights thicker and the shadows a little bit thinner. So that means you can't be afraid to lay down some serious paint in the lights. If you keep the shadows more thin and flat, then the lights are gonna feel more luminous in comparison. And I also love to let my warm underpainting show through in places in the shadows. When you have dramatic lighting like this, you're bound to see a lot of contrast. Let's make sense of all of it this way. Since most of our subject is lit, make sure that the amount of value used in lights is higher than in the shadows. In other terms, make the shadows more flat and have less values. Like you could make the shadows just one value so that it looks a lot simpler than your half tones and your lights. 
As a result, the shadows, they'll have less information in it than the parts that are lit. I'm thinking of this skull as an egg, with the closest part receiving the most light and the parts further away receiving the least amount of light. If the underlying egg of this skull reads well, then you're going to be in good shape. Our halftones are the most chromatic and the most information dense parts. So in our case, they're going to be the warmest parts of the skull. The lightest lights are pretty washed out, but they're still warm. Okay guys, don't forget to wipe down your palette whenever you're running out of space and also when your mixtures that you're using are becoming too thin. I find that when I'm too lazy to wipe my palette, what ends up happening is I'm painting off in some tiny corner of the, the palette and I don't have enough space to make a really thick mixture. So I start painting very thin. Now that our skull reads pretty well with the right values and the right color temperatures and we can sense that egg shape beneath it, it is time to put on the finishing touches. Here I am laying down some serious paint on the back of that skull. Since it's one of our lightest lights in the scene and I believe the lightest lights on the skull, I'm going to paint it thick. Since the cranium is just a sphere whose edges recede into the background, I want it to have a soft edge. For that, I'm dragging a big soft brush around the contour. This is a great time to expand our value range and paint up to the lightest lights and our darkest darks. At this stage, you want to be mindful of the quality of your edges. So to do that, you have to determine where the light source is coming from. Usually, your forms will roll by having a softer edge closer to the light and a harder edge further away from the light. So that happens because that edge further away from the light is actually a cast shadow and cast shadows are firmer than form rolling shadows. In our case, our light is actually coming from the bottom, which is a little bit unusual. This means that our forms are bound to have a sharper edge on the tops of the forms and a softer edge on the bottom. Usually in a life painting class, your model is lit from above, so you have the opposite situation. You have to be mindful of where the light is coming from because every situation is different. But the general rule is that whatever part of the form is facing away from the light is going to have a harder edge than the one facing towards it. Emphasizing the core shadows is great in a dramatic lighting situation. It really helps to bring the point home. So don't be afraid to push those. Since these are supposed to be your finishing strokes, you have to not be afraid to paint them with certainty and with boldness, even if you have no idea what you're doing. Honestly, a lot of times a boldly painted passage still looks a lot better than a technically accurate passage that was painted with uncertainty and trepidation. Generally speaking, to make your strokes look more bold and certain, you have to paint everything in as few strokes as you can. So that means you have to refrain from touching up areas as much as you can and avoid dragging all that paint around and trying to fix it because it just thins out the paint and it takes out all your brush strokes. Instead, if you want to adjust something, try adjusting it by adding new paint with a brand new brush stroke. The mood of this piece is very dramatic and it's meant to be kind of scary. So why not punch out his teeth? To do that, I'm going to paint a scary gap in these teeth that will add some visual interest to an otherwise boring area. I know for a lot of us, it can be very scary to put on a lot of paint when we aren't sure of what we're doing. You're afraid you're gonna cover up your drawing, but don't be afraid of covering it up and covering up any of the work you previously did because you can always repaint things over and over. If you painted it once, you can paint it again. And in fact, when you paint it again, you're gonna paint it even better than the first time. Besides, this isn't a portrait, so you don't have to worry about the likeness of the skull that much. Instead, you should worry about the likeness of the lighting. Ah, uh, yeah, I think it's time to admit that I painted that nose cavity too short. I was afraid of having to repaint it now that all that rendering is there, but 
it's no big deal. It's a little more hard to fix something now that you have a lot of opaque paint down. So it would have been better to fix it in the drawing stages, but you still have to do it. Okay, now that our skull looks decent, let's take care of that candle. Let me go light it and at the same time, I'm going to turn off that primary lamp so we can see how the candle burns much better. The candle light is surrounded by a very warm, soft edged glow, but the fire itself looks pretty sharp. I will start by rubbing out the shape of the light with a napkin that has some Gamsol in it. The candlestick itself is very blue, which is going to contrast really nicely with the glow of the hot candle wax above it. The transparency of that candle wax is carried across by how saturated and warm it is below the light. Now, the fire itself, it looks like around the candle wick is actually very blue. So I'm going to note that down in my painting. Unfortunately, the scene before my eyes isn't as dark as I wish it was because of all the lights that are on in the room. So I'm going to go ahead and paint darks around the candle to help it feel like it's glowing in contrast. I envisioned painting the light of the candle with one expert palette knife stroke, kind of like the precision stroke of a samurai's blade. Unfortunately, I'm not much of a palette knife samurai, so my stroke goes very wrong and my technique quickly becomes just me desperately applying stroke after stroke, just hoping it will stop looking bad. <laughs> you know, the trick in a situation like this is just to make it look like you meant to do that. Well, that's it for now. It still needs some touch-ups, I think, but I'm gonna do those at home in my studio. So let's call it a day. So I couldn't resist to do a few touch-ups. I adjusted the composition a little bit by adding this area here. I fixed some drawing errors. And most importantly, I got rid of the outlines between the teeth because if you make them too outlined, they look too separate. So it's better to merge them all into one mass when painting teeth. And you gotta be careful when fixing a painting from a photo after your life painting session, you might squeeze the life out of it. And so be careful not to lose those bold brush strokes. On a different note, I wanted to invite you guys to check out a new podcast that I'm starting called Creative Mastermind with a friend and fellow artist, Jordan Jardine. So together we're tackling self-development for artists. As you guys know, there's a lot of material on YouTube, different tutorial videos and workshops you can take to get better at painting or drawing. But what we feel is missing is the self-development side of things. So once you get good, what do you actually go on to do with that? How do you promote yourself? How do you make money? How do you stay happy? So to answer these questions, we reach deep into our own careers, but more importantly, we invite very experienced guests, which are artists, gallery owners, and even some businessmen to help us tackle this topic together. So please follow Creative Mastermind on iTunes to check us out. Also, if you guys want to follow me, check me out on Instagram at Pavel Sokov and send me a DM to say hello. This was a ton of fun. So guys, I encourage you to get out there with some paints and paint your own skull. Happy Halloween.